To understand the nuances of the Coen Brothers' film No Country for Old Men, one must examine the film as an exercise in perspective. The film opens with the monologue of Tommy Lee Jones' character, Sheriff Ed Tom Bell, lamenting the execution of a young boy who committed the ultimate crime, murder, for what appeared to be no reason at all. It baffles the grizzled veteran that such moral uncertainty can even exist in this world. These words are juxtaposed with the images of the West Texas landscape, the shadows of night giving way to the light of day. Early on, we are led to believe that even in these expanses of the wild unknown, the law and its moral code still exist. Except if you listen to Bell's words, to hear his monologue is to understand that this notion of comfort is at best fleeting, that the malignant darkness creeping into this world is here to stay. The crime you see now, it's hard to even take its measure. It's not that I'm afraid of it. I always knew you had to be willing to die to even do this job. But I don't want to push my chips forward and go out and meet something I don't understand. man would have to put his soul at hazard. He'd have to say, okay. I'll be part of this world. The constant struggle between fate and self-determination motivates each of the three main characters of this neo-Western thriller. What's more, it lies at the very heart of what makes this film work. And the key to unlocking these complex and dichotomous themes rests within the theory of moral relativism. Moral relativism is defined as the view that moral judgments are true or false only relative to some particular standpoint, for instance, that of a cultural or historical period, and that no standpoint is uniquely privileged over all others. Simply put, what we see as good and bad can be subjective. For example, Llewellyn Moss may find it morally appropriate to, in essence, steal $2 million, but is bound by something within himself to return to the scene of a crime to offer an injured man some water. Moss is filled with these contrasting principles, but each illustrates the subjectivity of his moral compass, influenced undoubtedly by his cultural circumstances. Another perfect example of this moral ambiguity lives within the Call It sequence, from the very first shot, we are uncomfortable. This unassuming station attendant stands just ahead of a series of cords that, arranged as they are, appear in the form of nooses, lingering just out of range. Chigurh walks into this frame, imposing himself upon the attendant. The conversation ensues, marking an exchange of small talk that escalates. Where the attendant asks simple, unassuming questions, Chigurh charges each, loading each moment with an ominous weight. The steady pace by which Sugar eats from the package of peanuts establishes a slow, metronome of sorts. His supply of peanuts will eventually run out. There's something wrong with what? With anything. Is that what you're asking me? Is there something wrong with anything? Sugar relies upon chance to determine the fates of many of his victims, suggesting that free will, neither their own nor his, can actively affect the outcome. In his mind, morality doesn't play into his decisions. In his mind, anything really can happen. And in effect, he's asking the attendant defiantly if there's something wrong with anything. Uh, well, I need to see about closing now. See about closing? Yes, sir. What time do you close? Now, we close now. No, it's not a time. What time do you close? Generally around dark, at dark. Another reference to the fact that Shiger is, by many accounts, the manifestation of the darkness so prevalent in this world. To close at dark is symbolic. To close is to die. This hidden meaning is mocked when Shiger follows up by saying, You don't know what you're talking about, do you? Sir? I said, you don't know what you're talking about. It is after this exchange that we get our first isolated shot of the cashier. The cords above his head now appear directly overhead, invading the frame even more. Smiley faces mock him from behind, and the light outside only serves to frame him within the darkness of which he is now isolated. You lived here all your life? This is my wife's father's place, uh, originally. 
you may return to it. If that's the way you want to put it. Well, I don't have some way to put it. That's the way it is. To say one has some way to put it is to imply that circumstance can be interpreted. A gray area of thinking that Sugar does not, and ultimately cannot, subscribe to. He puts the wrapper on the table, and with that, time is up. What's the most you ever lost on a coin toss? Sir? The most you ever lost on a coin toss. I don't know. I couldn't say. Call it. Call it, yes. For what? Just call it. It is at this point that the camera pushes forward. The first active movement the camera has made within oh. this entire scene. You need to call it. I can't call it for you. Well, it wouldn't be fair. I didn't put nothing up. Sugar is the coin. He is an extension of this eventuality, this relentless convergence of events. You stand to win everything, call it. All right. Heads in. By actively participating, the attendant has to a certain extent accepted the terms of Sugar's strict code of rules. Contrast this with one of the final scenes in the film, in which Sugar gives Carla Jean Moss the same opportunity to actively participate in her fate, but instead chooses to deny Sugar the clarity of making the decision for him. Well, I got here the same way that Colin did. Well done. There's something terrifying about the simplicity of this scene. That Sugar is willing to dangle the fate of this man's life on a coin toss just because. He's amused by it, if only fleetingly. The title, No Country for Old Men, comes from the William Butler Yeats 1928 poem, Sailing to Byzantium, in which he describes, That is no country for old men, the young, in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song. And therefore, I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. Cormac McCarthy, and in turn, the Coen brothers, take a decidedly darker interpretation. Instead of the youth of today caught up in some song-filled, beautiful tapestry of nature, the world has succumbed to an evil, morally corrupt version of a country its predecessors once enjoyed. Today's current state of politics, film, television, and pop culture reflect a post-morally relativistic society. An adherence to strict political correctness and an allegiance to the kind of good versus evil storytelling that arose as a response to this more ambiguous, more complicated predecessor. But at the time of the novel's release in 2005, and the film adaptation that followed just two years later, each was a product of a time in the United States in which the Iraq War had, in the years since fighting first began, painted the country with the familiar, unsettling hues of Vietnam. Uncertainty and anger were palpable influences, and the careful reference to Vietnam throughout the film certainly draws this distinction. Nam? Oh, yes, sir, two tours. What outfit? 12th Infantry Battalion, uh, August 7th, 1966, July 2nd, 1968. It is within this very uncertain landscape, this divisive and derisive atmosphere, that the characters of No Country for Old Men must navigate. One chooses the role of active participant, one of cautious observer, and one the harbinger of this world's dark intentions. The world hasn't lost its way solely as a result of war, but as one of Bell's confidants points out, Oh, it's the tide. It's the dismal tide. It is not the one thing. Not the one thing. We are left to wonder, who is right? Who do we look to when determining the moral ambiguity of this world and by extension, our own. The active participant Llewellyn Moss dies at the hands of those equally as greedy, and Anton Chigurh becomes a product of his own code of unavoidable fate. It is Ed Tom Bell who offers one final piece of solemn advice in the final moments of this film. In describing a dream about his father, Bell suggests that even in this world of uncertainty, this world of darkness and fear, there is always one guiding principle that offers strength to those who choose to see it. Hope. And in the dream I knew that he was going on ahead. 
and he's fixing to make a fire somewhere out there in all that dark and all that cold. And I knew that whenever I got there, he'd be there. And then I woke up. There you have it. Uh, that was our very first episode of the Essays on Frame series. It's a brand new channel in association with Exit Only Theater. I'm JP Lee. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is a bit of a passion project for me, letting my film geek freak flag fly, I guess. I'm surprised I even got that out loud once. Please subscribe below wherever the link ends up here. I look forward to, to producing more of these. They, they take a little time to put together, but... I, I, they're a lot of fun for me, and I think that they're worth it to, to a few people out there. So um, I look forward to uh, the next one. Tell them that God's gonna cut them down. Tell them that God's gonna cut them down.